It is far more fun to die on your sword than to die on someone else's. Hello. Thank you. First of all, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Uh, I'm thrilled to be in this amazing city. I'm, want, I'm really, really happy to be in front of you. And I gave a lot of thought backstage and on the flight out here last night on what I wanted to address. And it was interesting for me to think about the theme that really drove me during that thought process, which is ironically a pretty interesting word, which is practicality. You know, I think that when we talk about innovation or new technology, talking about uh, this morning and what you do in your professional lives, I find it interesting that all those wonderful things that were just read, probably written by my mom before I got out here, I've always been somebody who people think are is disruptive or futuristic or is, is predicting the future. And the reality is, I genuinely believe that the reason that I have the luxury of standing up here in front of you today is that I'm grossly practical. I believe that I've never been that outrageously in front. It is my belief that 95% of the market is behind. When I think about what's going through so many of your heads, I actually now, deeper into my career, believe that most of you believe, agree, or understand the far majority of the things that have been said all day. I think the organizations and the politics and the way you score things internally have stopped you from doing them. I believe most of you as human beings know what to do with the money to make the business result that you want, but when you put on your business outfit and go into the organization, you're unable to because of the rules of the game. And I'm fascinated by that because I come from a very entrepreneurial background. I'm gonna assume a lot of you don't know who I am, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of my bio because it is the seed in which everybody in this room needs to anchor against if they want to really win succeed or even to be very honest, stay alive in the world we're going into. A Couple hours before I took the stage, my favorite retail store in America growing up, Toys R Us, just filed chapter 11, right? When I come from a retail background, you're about to hear this. This is not an anomaly. Over the next decade, the far majority of big box retailers that we know are gonna go directly out of business. And I think that it's fascinating that people don't understand. Even the business that I'm about to tell you about, that I innovated 20 years ago, the direct-to-consumer wine business that I built for my dad, we're in deep trouble because Amazon bought Whole Foods, giving them a liquor license in every state, and Amazon, even though they haven't started yet, is already the number one retailer of wine before they even start. And when I sit and think about the hospitality space and every other space, forget about the potential macro disruption of Airbnb, and I think that's probably been talked at nausea in the last half decade in this space, it is far greater than that. I think if I could achieve anything in this talk today, uh, besides maybe going into some practical practitionership that I'll leave you with because I think that's important, it's that I just genuinely believe, me included, that this room, and let's think about this room, we're far more ahead of the, 7.7 billion people in debating what does this all mean from a business perspective, but even this room, I think is grossly underestimating what is gonna happen over the next 10 years in consumer behavior, and I think that's super important. At the same token, I believe that a lot of us will overestimate the impact of VR or certain things in machine learning and AI and many other things, and that's why I started this talk with one word, practicality. If you're too far ahead, you are not practical. If you're too far behind, you are not practical. The reason, yes, perfect. The reason it says that I day trade attention is because literally I day trade attention. Before anybody here tells the end consumer, whether in a B2B or B2C environment, how great your product and service is, you need somebody's attention. It is the number one thing, the only thing, you know, every time I come, I go and speak to the organizers and I say, who's the audience, what are they about, what do they care about, and then I try to tailor the conversation to that. But the only thing that I can always say, no matter where I speak or how I conversate, is that we all trade on attention. 
and then we have our chance to tell that person what we're about, and then the outcome happens. Whether that's filling hotel rooms, whether that's maximizing percentage of wallet of that individual, whether that's to get them to donate to a tragic event, or whatever you may be in the business of. I was born in the Soviet Union, and my family immigrated to the US when I was three years old. We, uh, we moved into a studio apartment in Queens, New York, half the size of this stage with eight family members. So I, I started in a very kind of interesting, humble beginning. That's what my dad did. You know, I didn't see him, we had nothing. Like, with, I had one toy for seven years because every dollar was saved so that he can then buy a small liquor store in New Jersey to make our American dream and that's what he did. I was a very entrepreneurial kid. By the time we moved to Edison, New Jersey where he became a manager of a liquor store, I was six and I was already selling. My first business transaction was I got the great idea at five, six years old to go around the neighborhood, go into people's yards, rip their flowers out of their yard, go to their door, ring their doorbell, and sell it back to them. (laughs) Amazing business model, by the way. Uh, (laughs) So, that was me. That gives you a little insight to how I was wired. I'll tell you later how my dad saved me from being a bullshit artist. The reality is this. The reason I'm bringing up the origin story is something very weird happened. I only remembered this a couple years ago. If you've seen this talk on YouTube in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, I don't talk about this part. And then a friend told me something and it triggered a memory. When I was seven years old, I had all my friends in the neighborhood commenced to stand behind lemonade stands and I had seven, six, or five lemonade stands going every summer day. It's interesting what I did though and it's gonna be very important to where I'm going. I didn't stand behind a lemonade stand, not because I was fancy and thought I was the big boss, it's because I would walk up and down the streets of my neighborhood, sit down, literally sit down on the grass and for, think about this, I'm now seven years old. I would, I, I would th- as a seven year old, I thought it was interesting to sit on the grass and for three, four hours at a time, watch cars drive by to try to figure out which tree or which pole to put my lemonade sand sign on. And so somewhere two or three years ago, I go, my God, for, it wasn't that I was taught intuitively I've been chasing attention my whole life. I am fascinated by where attention is today. We have never, ever seen more disruption to the end consumer's attention than we're seeing right now. What 50% of the global consumer's attention means on this device as a platform, you have no opportunity of succeeding going forward. And all of a sudden, the Facebooks and the WeChats and the LinkedIn's and the YouTube's become a hell of a lot more serious. And so for me, what I really want to figure out in this room is the following. Number one, do we have a healthy debate in this audience about the thing that has really popped top of mind to me in the last three to four years, which is the following. There is a substantial difference between selling and branding. And yet, over the last six years, I've become unbelievably aware that the biggest companies in the world mix the two all the time. And I believe, you know, it's funny, I say a lot of things because the way I speak is improv and I kind of adjust to you. When I just said that, it was interesting to see how many people's heads reacted to that. And it's a stunningly big debate because as we become more digital in our society, the math becomes more obvious. And I've been fascinated as somebody who used quant and math in the early, mid 90s to build a business that we've become religious about math to a fault in our environment and aren't having the proper debate of what the variable of success is. Or we're not compartmentalizing it and letting math be math over here from a sales transaction standpoint but then allocating the right dollars to art and creative as a variable to drive our businesses. And what happens when you actually build a brand, how it affects the math and drives down those costs and things of that nature. So I think we are, I'll say it very, very, very black and white. I think this room, we are 
depending on how your DNA is structured and how you see the world, we are either the luckiest or the least lucky marketers and operators ever because the stakes are enormously high. The stakes are so, so high because the biggest companies in the world will change spots over the next 10 years because of how much attention is actually in this device. We are, we are stunningly underestimating the speed in which the transactions are going to occur on different places and how and why and who has the leverage and why. Let me explain. In 1996, I launched winelibrary.com. It was one of the first three to five e-commerce wine businesses. My dad had a liquor store doing $3.7 million in revenue on 10% gross profit. So we had no money. Um, you know, the internet, you know, how many people here had email in 1997? Raise your hand. Perfect, great. So a lot of you remember, in 1997, for some of the youngsters in this room, the way we read email was we read every fucking email. The marketing that my dad had done and the little marketing that I started doing was more direct mail, was newspaper advertising, and it was fascinating to me to see email I remember why I took email so serious in 1996. I thought by the year 2000, they would charge us to send email because it was such a good deal. Like I just couldn't wrap my head, remember? Like I couldn't wrap my head around how is this free? I was competing against liquor stores that were sending catalogs in the mail. I would get a Chateau Lafitte and send it to them that day. The catalog would come a month later. It cost them $3 to print it and a dollar to ship. Spending so much money on programmatic banner garbage that is, looks good on math from a media buying agency standpoint but is doing nothing for our businesses that I don't wanna be the digital guy, I wanna be the what's the attention worth guy. And so for me, it's interesting because I'm always looking for an arbitrage. I just did everything right for five years in hindsight and it was to make every penny worth a dollar and that's when you trade attention. That's when you're trying to underbuy attention and not overspend on attention. On Google for three days before I realized Google AdWords comes out, it's three days old, excuse me, I start running ads. I owned every wine term in America for five cents a click. This was before they made a 10 cents minimum. I mean the word wine, let alone the word Bordeaux or Chateau Lafitte or what have you. I owned the word wine for nine months before anybody bid me up. And as you guys can all imagine, the ROI was remarkable and this is when I had my second regret. How many people here play poker? Raise your hands. Great, I don't, but I do understand the following. When you have the best hand and you know you have the best hand, it's probably a good idea in certain circumstances to go all in. I had the best hand with Google AdWords, but I didn't go all in. My business was growing, I went from three to 15 million like that, right? I had the dollars to spend, but I was still mixing my media. I was still doing outdoor. I was doing local radio. I was doing direct mail. I'm an operator, I run my businesses. I'm here to buy under, for example, right now I'm looking at outdoor media in America very aggressively because prices are collapsing. So I don't love it. I think every single passenger looks at their phone, so I don't think it's as good of a deal as it was 15 years ago from eyeballs, but if the price gets low enough, I could be convinced. And so for me, that's the thing that is never being talked about. Everybody's drawing lines in the sand in our marketing lab. It's I'm digital, I'm traditional, right? There's all these bots and this is all bullshit and on digital or you know, nobody watches a television commercial. We have these lines in the sand and we don't have complicated depth, much more thoughtful conversations of what's happening and then we don't layer at all branding versus sales in those two environments and I think these are things that I think a lot about. My career took a super interesting turn in 2006. So I'm trucking along with email and Google, right? And I'm doing my thing, business is getting really big. As you can imagine for an immigrant family, we made it, right? I bought my car at a garage sale. My brother AJ, who's 11 years younger, got a brand new Lexus. I'm a little bitter, but you know, it is what it is. So I'm trucking along, things are going good, and then I come across a website, it's three months old at the time, and it's called YouTube. And at this point, YouTube, for any of you that saw YouTube in the first six months, it was a very interesting site. YouTube, really YouTube's first seed was a dating site. 
which really gets referenced nowhere outside of their Wikipedia if you look it up, it's pretty interesting. But then very quickly, as you may remember, it was all copyrighted material, right? It was all Saturday Night Live and Jimmy Fallon. And I looked at it and I said, huh, this is interesting. I really, again, intuition, I was like, this is gonna be something. So I started playing and a couple months later, I launched a video blog called Wine Library TV. My family business is called Wine Library. And it was the first time that content had entered my life. At the, up until this point, I was a retailer, operator, and advertiser and marketer. This was the first time that content, something that I didn't have to spend any money on distribution, entered my life. My concept with Wine Library TV was simple. I sat in front of my table, in front of a camera, at, with three to four bottles of wine, and I drank them for 20 minutes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> best gig I ever had. Um, and it worked, and it worked for a couple reasons. Number one, it worked because YouTube was right and it was gonna go on to become big. Number two, I thought I was gonna do QVC and Home Shopping Network, I thought it was gonna sell, but as soon as that red light that I see right now came on, I realized, oh shit, this is forever recorded, and if you come to me at a party and say, what do you think about this glass of wine, if I say it's gibberish, but on my show, I said it was great because I wanted to move it, everything would die. So literally, it's funny, I can go, I did a thousand episodes of this show. If I go back to episode one, somewhere around three minutes, because you know how you know yourself, I can see in my face, I'm like, oh shit, I better actually review these the way they have to be reviewed. And so I realized very quickly, I needed to become America's wine guy not the salesman for my store, which led to a very intriguing era for me where I was panning wines of good suppliers and caused a lot of politics. But this is not why I'm telling you this story. I'm telling you this story because the impact on our business was extraordinary. And it was more ROI positive than any advertising that I was doing. And it's led me to a thesis that I wanna leave with, and this is gonna be one of the tidbits I don't know if you write things down, I'm setting it up so you remember it. If you asked me, if we were having dinner and you asked me, what's the number one thing my hospitality group can do? It would be the following, and this is the first time I tasted it in 2006 and I'll give you more of how this has evolved over the last 10 years. I genuinely believe, even if you are in this auditorium right now and you're a B2B SaaS provider for hospitality groups, I believe the statement I'm about to say, which is the following. Going into the next decade, I believe everybody's company in here is a media company first, comma, what they ever do for a living. I believe that if you can wrap your head, and listen, this is not a small thing. The thought that every single person here needs to bring in an editor-in-chief, a producer, a head of content, a chief content officer, is not common talk. And I don't mean a marketer, I mean somebody that works at the Wall Street Journal or the BBC or Sports Illustrated. Somebody who is in the media business gets injected and now you become a lifestyle magazine. Now you become a weekly TV show on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram that the number one arbitrage of the next decade, like I believe every single person's company in this room should have a weekly or bi-weekly podcast that is targeted to the audience that they're trying to affect. Leveled up to not be a sales pitch, but to be what Wine Library TV was for me, which is I just tried to provide value. Of course there was trickle down economics to what I was doing, but I never wavered in church and state, which is imperatively difficult for every company in here. And that is a bet that most people won't take because you have to spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars up front with no clear cut ROI in the first 12, 24, or 36 months. That was the first time I felt that. And then basically at that point in my career, I decided that I was right about email and e-commerce and YouTube and Google AdWords and that I was being stupid, that making more money selling a couple more cases of Shout Enough to Pop was probably not the right strategy with this intuition. I promised myself the next time I felt it, that feeling, I would become an investor because Google bought YouTube, I read an article about angel investing, and I was like, what is this? And that changed the course of my career and probably brought me here today. Uh, in 2007, I saw three of those companies. They were Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook. Those were the first three investments I made. As you can imagine, that changed the course of my life. And then in 2009, I really took an interesting turn, and it's where all of us connect, which is I started a company called Vayner Media with my brother AJ. I decided that I wanted to build a private equity operating firm, but the way I was gonna do that was I was gonna spend 10 years in the agency business learning every industry 
and figuring out why they were spending the money the way they did and build a very large firm and take it from there. And that's what I'm doing now. Over the last five to six years, I've actively been the CEO of an 800 person agency, New York, LA, London, big brands, Pepsi, Unilever, um, Choice Hotels, you know, things of that nature. So I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been very interesting to me and the biggest takeaway for me is very simple. We are just not marketing in the year that we live in. And more importantly, we're not marketing in the day that we live in. That I believe the majority of you are measuring ROI incorrectly that are usually in the vested interest of the people that are selling you the media. Uh, I think that there's a completely broken system. I think that there's a substantial reason why the biggest brands in the world are losing and will continue. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, 91 to 93%, depending on what report you believe, of the Fortune 500 companies have, in the CPG landscape have declined over the last three years. We are pouring unbelievable amounts of money into places where people are not paying attention, namely direct mail, television, and programmatic banner digital advertising. And, uh, and there's going to be carnage. I don't know what else to really tell you. There's going to be an enormous turnover and there's an enormous opportunity in this room. And so for me, a couple things to focus on in one, by the way, one man's point of view in the State of the Union of attention. The most underpriced attention, hands down, in the market today is Facebook. So what's remarkable about Facebook is it's so underpriced and has so much attention that even when poorly executed sales, creative, and targeting is deployed, it still does a little something which is why it's really confused the market. What Facebook is for me, to paint a picture that I think everybody will understand, is I believe that Facebook is the birth child of television and direct mail. If you ask me how I think about Facebook, I think it's TBC and FSIs came together and created Facebook. That if you really understand how to use Facebook, the way to do it is to take your first party data or their data create above the line creative branding content, low cost, biggest issue for a lot of bigger companies here is the agencies they work with to do creative, the creative is too expensive to do the model that I believe in and you're not creating five or six or seven or 13 commercials or 45 to 50 print or outdoor which is what I call pictures in a Facebook feed because it's too expensive. But if you were able to, with your internal or external partners, produce the seven to 11 videos and the 50 pictures and look at the quantum qual feedback that you would then be able to spend 10 to 15% of your marketing, non-working and working dollars on that, look at the insights that have elevated from that and then pour lighter fluid on the pieces of content and stories that are driving your business, both from a sales and a branding standpoint. If you look, how many people here, by show of hands, are familiar with Wish, the shopping app? Raise your hands high, I wanna see. Higher, please. Great. So, for the people that are not familiar with Wish, the shopping app, if you open your phone now, and feel free to, it won't bother me, I'll just keep talking. And you open, the, if you have an Apple phone, and but by the way, Google as well, if you go look at the top 100 apps in the free store, ranked, in almost every country, Wish is a top 100 app. Let me tell you who started Wish. Former Google employees, many of which worked on the paid and advertising product, who realized that Facebook was such an underpriced arbitrage, raised a lot of capital, and ran all their media dollars and creative in a Facebook world to build this shopping app that is now transacting in the billions globally. Yet. Even an educated crowd, you know, 70, 80%, 60% still don't know what it is. And to me, that's fascinating and an opportunity. To me, you've got to look at what Purple Mattress is doing. For anybody who hasn't looked at this, this is a very interesting case study that I think would work unbelievably well for hotels and hospitality groups. You would Google Purple Mattress. They're very interesting because they're doing a good job with both. They're doing sales and branding. They're doing a lot of quant-based transactional creative in a Facebook and Instagram environment to drive customers. But if you go on their website right now on your phone, you'll see three to four silly videos. Probably things that you would associate with Dollar Shave Club's video. They're taking the creative risks, gambling, 
50 to $100,000 at a time to make a video that creates top of the funnel awareness that drives down all their transactional costs. To me, when I think about the task at hand for so many of you to sell rooms, to sell packages, for me what's fascinating is there's a platform today where you can do the branding that you love and want to do so much. Do that and you get that minute 37 seconds in front of, and don't forget, a lot of you, Jesus, excuse me, you guys are sitting with so much first party data that it could be unbelievably interesting. I mean, I'm flabbergasted with organizations that sit with first party consumer data and don't realize converting on Facebook with that and then the lookalike, I mean, do you know how unbelievably sophisticated the lookalike audiences now look like in Facebook? So you're basically got yours to reinforce at a low cost. Attention. I don't give a shit what the CPM is. I know you could buy programmatic travel, 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 dot org banner ads for a little bit less, but it's a fucking banner ad on the bottom left hand corner of a desktop computer. Nobody saw it. And so you're trading on efficiencies of media because you're paying $4 on travel, 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 dot org. And yet in Facebook you could pay $6.12, yet somebody sees it. Yet somebody interacts with it. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. You know what it is? Very honestly. When I ran my dad's liquor store, we ate. We were sheltered by how much money we made. The biggest, my biggest thesis, by the way, in corporate dynamics is that nobody actually cares about the business. That everybody's navigating the politics and the scoring internally and nobody cares about the business. Like, no, I promise you, if your family's health was on the line, you wouldn't be buying fucking banner ads. Anyway, sorry about that, I needed that for myself. (laughs) Anyway, you make a compelling minute 37 second video for your brand. If you're really smart, you make four of them that trade on different things. Maybe one of them stars an African American family which you target against African Americans. Maybe one shows a family that has three kids of high net worth and you target people that have $100,000 income against your first party data. If you're smart, if you're a practitioner, if you're not just talking theory and you're not just headline reading that Facebook's reporting problems or what you have, if you're actually a practitioner, not a headline reader and you do that, when you remarket the people that watch the entire minute 37 seconds with what I would call a right hook, an offer, a discount, a sale, that sells product. We're sitting in a great gap between practitioners and headline readers. It is the most obvious thing to me in the space and it is why so many small brands will close the gap over the next half decade and become major players because they're making every penny work their asses off and companies are taking dollars and putting them directly in the trash. And at the end of the day, attention and awareness is everything. And more importantly, so many of you become completely suffocated by transactional math that you get to a place where eventually you run out of space, right? And you're just sales. And you just become commoditized. And you're playing on price and conversion and DR. And then you're super vulnerable. And you're super vulnerable to the thing that I'm most fearful of, which is the real competitors to this space haven't even started, right? If you really think where this is going, you know, these platforms have so much power and matter, including our hosts. Then you have the macro platforms, the Googles and the Facebooks and the things of that nature. You haven't even tasted. The reason I'm so passionate about marketing, it's the one place you can move very quickly. You know, and what's been scary to me is leaders like this room, you know, literally, this is, and you're gonna have to help me with this. I'm still not fully understanding this oftentimes feel like they're working for the agencies instead of the other way around. I mean, it's flabbergasting to me watching my clients know they're doing wrong behavior but the politics of the C-suite having relationships with one of the holding companies don't allow them to make the decision. And so that's where we're at right now. We're in one of the great eras of change. This is just starting. And we are judging technology in a very interesting way. One of the things that I love is our complete lack of misunderstanding about what's happening here. For example, we critique our kids for being too digital, right? We critique social norms. For example, everybody in this room has gone to a restaurant, seen a couple sitting at a dinner table, and both of them are on the phone, and you say something to your partner or friend and go, look at at this, isn't this so sad? I see that 
and I go a very different direction. I see a couple sitting at a table on their phone the whole time and I'm happy. I'm very happy for them. And I'll tell you why I'm happy for them. Everybody in this room 15 years ago went into a restaurant and saw that same couple. Let me tell you what that couple was doing. They were sitting at that table looking at each other, not saying a goddamn word. (laughs) Technology doesn't change us, my friends. Technology exposes us. When I see a couple both on their phone the entire time at dinner, I don't judge the technology. I just know that their relationship is fucked up. (laughs) It's true. And le- thank you, and let me tell you why I told you that story because this is where it gets really important for you guys as operators. There's a lot of people in here who have not started getting serious about marketing on Instagram because they don't like Instagram, because they don't use Instagram. The amount of people here that are using their one human personal opinion on their romantic point of view on how society should be when they make judgments on running their business is scary. I day trade attention. One of the best things going for me right now in American marketing is Snapchat. Here's why. Because every single person is judging Snapchat on the stock price and the health of their business and the copying of their features or that they stopped using it because they're using Instagram. And so we do not have sophisticated enough conversations on the creative variable because creative has gotten so expensive that you're not able to test properly at scale and make proper decisions. The amount of times that I've tested four videos that we've paid $50,000 for and the variables have been extraordinary from if this was the video that we spent all of our Facebook dollars on it would have been a major flop to this video has changed the outcome of that brand's business. is staggering creative. That does not mean make 8,000 shitty pieces of content. It means if you're spending $100,000 to make a video, that can be made for 47. If you're spending 290, it can be made for 156. If you're spending 50, it can be made for 17. And you need it to be because all those great ideas that you may have that never make it to the consumer can and should be made and tested. If you don't spend your media dollars up front and you spend it after you understand what's happening, you will be far more successful. But you need to have the creative. That to me is the big arbitrage, the thing that tomorrow you can do to change your business, the thing that drives down all your transactional digital, I mean, listen, whether it's bookings or Google or your own site, you're transacting. The thing that will get the CAC and the LTV and all the things that matter to you that you're measuring on down is your brand. The way you make your brand relevant is you speak to consumers where they're actually spending their time. If you have not wrapped your head around that it has disproportionately four to five social networks and then some secondary media outlets. I'll tell you one that I'm gonna spend some time on right now. Looking at the time, I wanna pivot very sharply. I went to Seattle this week, excuse me, last week, and spent the entire day with developers building on top of Alexa and Amazon. I will tell you that the thing that matters to me the most right now in the way that I do business is the first six minutes of your morning in 2022. If you ask me what I'm spending my time on, the flight out here last night, you know, planes tend to be the only place where I get to think. When I was thinking, what I was thinking about is one very simple thesis. What do the first six minutes of your morning, all of you, first six minutes of every one of yours mornings look like in 2022? And to me, it's very simple. You will have a device in your home, in every room, whether it is an Amazon Alexa, whether it is a Google Home, whether it's an Apple HomePod, whether it's three or four of the other major leaders in technology or a company that we don't know that's being built right here in your backyard, everybody in this room will have a device in their home that is talking to them for the first five minutes of every morning. I believe that in the same way that Amazon built its company on the back of Google AdWords because Jeff Bezos spent a hell of a lot more money than I did for my wine business, that Somebody in this room will separate themselves from everybody else because they created the Alexa skill or the Alexa briefing 
that their hospitality group was able to make valuable to people, including the weather. You know, every one of you will listen to a machine telling you the weather as you brush your teeth in four years. It's going to happen. How, how do you in this room create something that's valuable for every person on earth that penetrates those first five minutes that they listen to that somehow ties into your business? Nobody wants to know fun facts about your business. Nobody wants to know that. People want to know the traffic, the weather, what their meetings look like today, things of that nature. How? How can you penetrate 365 days a year that when I wake up and go, Alexa, play my briefings, and she talks for six minutes, how can the weather be brought to you by this group? How can the weather be brought to you by this hotel? How can your travel plans be brought? What can you do? I would tell you that the next frontier of marketing is 100% voice. That between these AI, these skills, these briefings, these platforms in our home, and the stunning explosion of podcasts and our audio consumption, and let me tell you why. One of the great misses of my career was I passed on Uber in the angel round at a $4 million valuation twice. Travis was such a good friend, he came back to me four months later and begged me and I still didn't do it. When I did later invest, which I'll still do okay, well actually, who the fuck knows these days, but you know, when I did invest later, it was on a very interesting reason to why I became bullish on Uber. I realized that Uber was not a transportation business, Uber was selling time. The number one thing that everybody in this room is obsessed with besides the health of their family, money, religion, Literally, one of the four to five pillars of our society, the thing you care about the most subconsciously for most of you is time, right? It's why for all the UI, UX developers and designers here, if you're here, it's friction, right? Friction's bad, right? Time. And I'm telling you right now, how many people here now listen to podcasts? Raise your hand. Raise them high. I want everybody to see. How many of those same people, by raising your hand, were not listening to a podcast three years ago? Raise your hand. This is what's interesting to me. The reason we're listening to podcasts is because you can do something else while it's happening. We have become so addicted with efficiency and time is so valuable that you could watch, the reason my podcast, it's not even, notice it's not even on my updated speaking sheet, right, which I'll have to move over here because this, If you wanna watch this talk, you've gotta watch it. When I transcribe it to a podcast, you can do two things, let alone one, while you listen. Will you get everything? Absolutely not. Are we happy with 74% so we can do the other things? Absolutely. I would implore you to get very smart about how voice plays out. For the operators in this room, who's gonna be the first significant hospitality group to have those customized in your rooms? right, really can bring value. Think about the arbitrage if my room's talking to me, all the things you spend time on. Think about all the efficiencies. I'm not looking to put the concierge out of business, but I'm looking to think about angles that are gonna let you win going forward. And everybody here, how many of you have a child in your life, grandchild or or child that's under 10 years old? Raise your hands. Have you seen the phenomenon that I see with my kids, which is if they see any, if my son Xander was here and thought this was a screen, he would try to swipe this. Please understand that I, in six years, you, and this is, you know, six years goes fast. In six years, you will expect everywhere you are to have a box that can react to what you need. You will expect that. Because in 24, 36 months, it's gonna be in every home. And then once you're outside the home, you're just gonna expect it. It's already gonna be in every car. Every car manufacturer's got it. 36 months from now, every car's doing it. You remember how you were scared about your kids driving and texting, like it's scarier than drunk driving? It's never gonna get to that. If you have kids that are five, six years away from driving, they're never gonna text. They're gonna be doing everything with voice. Because it's just speed, it's why we got into texting. It's speed, time. How many people here, watch this. This is a good one, don't lie. Lying is the devil. How many people here, by show of hands, are now mad, mad, when somebody calls them on the phone? Raise your hands. Raise it high. Own it. I want you to look around. Keep it up. Do you know why these pioneers are mad? They're mad because that person's taking their time. 
That person should text me or email me and I'll get back to you on my time. The fuck are you calling me, (laughs) mom? (laughs) And now you're getting full circle. Do you know what attention is predicated on? The thing that's most interesting or is stealing the least amount of time? You know what steals time? A pop-up banner on a website. (laughs) And definitely on a phone, because it's really scary, because I don't know if you saw, those X's, they're really small. And our thumbs, a little fat. And so we click it, and we try to X it out, but by accident we hit it, right? Then we waste four seconds and we're mad, because we feel four seconds. Back home at your company and your media agency, you look at the reports and go, wow, what a great campaign. 2% click through. Meanwhile, those people are never fucking working with you because they hate you for stealing the time. (laughs) We have to start debating what's behind the math. Do you understand? And And you guys know it. We're trading on math now in marketing and it's a huge mistake. It's an important part. I'm so happy it's here. It makes a lot of people that are just artsy fartsy held accountable. I love that. I'm so glad that creative directors can't run around anymore and go, well one day, seven years ago, I won a can lion so you have to trust me. I love that, that's great. But at the same token, we have gone way too far in the other direction. It is the combination of the two, which is why currently Facebook is the great platform, but I would be thrilled to come back here in six years and laugh at anybody working on Facebook. I could care less if Facebook dies tomorrow. I, Instagram to me, if you're in the hospitality business, is oxygen, it's insane, insane, not to have a major investment into Instagram influencers, ads, and creative, and be in the hospitality business, are you insane? It is the single most important creative outlet platform, yet nobody has a mature strategy against it. Nobody's pouring any real dollars into it and we trade on bullshit metrics like likes. When are we gonna mature this conversation? When are we gonna finally have the right conversation? When are we gonna actually debate where we're spending our money? When are we gonna start taking scrutiny on where we spend our money so we can take 30% of that money back that we know is going in the garbage once you spend one second actually looking at it and put it into it? When are we not gonna be just sales transactional and fill rooms but take 20% of that money to do creative, to build brand in places where people actually are so we can drive down the cost of our sales transaction and by year two, making that investment made you get the same amount of sales but also build brand. You better start doing this stuff now because if you're not on the cutting edge, AKA the normal current edge of what you should be doing with marketing, you have no shot against where we're going next. You start getting into what messenger bots and AI, you start getting into that world, you start getting into the maturity of AR, the fact like when you start actually having, I mean the next iPhone has the AR kit in it already like Literally your customers in 24 months are gonna expect things to be happening in their room. Like, I mean, there's so much coming. And we are just sitting and doing the same old thing and we're not having the conversation. And let me leave you with this. How many people here work for a company? Raise your hands. This is the one that really bothers me the most. Over the last 10 years, seven, excuse me, over the last six years, I've become friendly with a lot of my clients. You know, and whether it's, after I get them drunk with four bottles of rosé at Cannes or over dinner in New York, there's always that moment when there's finally a little bit of trust. Once they realize that this agency is really a proxy for me to do something else and I'm not just trying to get their scope, once I get comfortable, once we get comfortable, every one of them starts to talk about all the things that they're doing that they don't believe in. I'm gonna leave you with this because I've been watching a lot of head nods in this room. It is far more fun to die on your sword than to die on someone else's. Let me tell you how this will play out and you will remember this. You will remember this. By the way, amazing socks. You will remember this. (laughs) And while I'm at it, your fucking hair is phenomenal, bro. (laughs) This is how it's gonna play out because this is how it's played out the last two times there was big disruption. You are doing things right now. Yesterday, you made a decision that you don't believe in but you're smart. You did it because you know how your company scores, right? You know it. I know it, you know it. Fine, makes sense. Here's the problem with disruption and innovation. When shit hits the fan, and it will, and it's close, 
When shit hits the fan, right now you're being rewarded for being a yes person and in 36 months you're gonna be fired for being a yes person because they're gonna blame you for doing that work and that's fucked up. And if you think you're gonna be able to go and work for the other Fortune 500 companies, the new ones, who are just built on this religion, you won't. Go do some homework on what happened between 1947 and 1964 in marketing and business. Because we went to a primary television society instead of a primary radio society, all the people that looked like you, that were yesing radio's ROI, got into a real sticky situation. I'm not telling you to quit your job. I'm not saying to go to your CMO or CEO and say go fuck yourself. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you truly believe it, listen, you may not believe a word I'm saying, so mazel tov, you do you. But if you believe in something, if you believe you're taking those dollars and you're spending them against things that are not the best way you could be spending them, please voice it in a professional manner so it's on the record, because somebody's watching. The bravado, the stuff that isn't practical yet, I lose. I lose every time in the beginning until I win. I lost in 1996, seven, eight, nine, because my dad should have bought another liquor store. They made fun of me. My dad's friends made, you should have bought another liquor store, not spend all that money on a website. They all laughed until they didn't, right? I got made fun of for buying Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr stock because I should have taken that lots of money to me at the time of my advisors and accountants and put it into something safe or a home because I was a young man. They all laughed until they didn't. This is real. You know it and I know it. You just need to do something about it. Thank you. It's on, it's on, it's on, tell everybody it's on Hey, turn it up, baby, it's your song Hey, how could I go wrong? I had it all along <laughs> Now we on, we on, we on, tell everybody we on Hey, turn it up, baby, it's your song Hey, how could I go wrong? I had it